welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, episode number 82. My name is Jason Romano. Thanks so much for joining us on the program today. As always, you can subscribe and download this podcast on Apple iTunes Podcast, Google Play, and Stitcher, of course, everywhere else podcasts are found. We are there. You can also find all of our podcasts and a lot of video content over at our YouTube channel. Just search Sports Spectrum. And of course, everything we put out, including our brand new revamped website, is at SportsSpectrum.com. We redesigned this site and would love to have you guys take a look at it. SportsSpectrum.com. And I think I think you'll like it. I think you'll like the design. It takes a little getting used to, but I think you'll like it. I think you'll like the way it's structured and organized. And I like the way that we present the content and the way it's set up as far as topics and as far as the where you can find um, what we post and, and what we're posting about. So check it out, sportspectrum.com. We're very proud of that site and the way it looks now. And it's really setting up for what I think is a, a pretty incredible future here in 2018 for Sports Spectrum, where you can become a partner with us for just $36. It's for an entire year. You get our quarterly magazine and you help fund all of the free content that we provide, including our Football Sunday, which we released during the Super Bowl. Of course, this podcast is free and we have to fund that as well. And all of our articles at sportspectrum.com are funded by your generosity, $36 for an entire year. And plus we get our, our quarterly magazine out. Our next one should be released sometime in mid, mid-March and uh, very excited about that as well. So check it out, sportspectrum.com. Become a member and join us and partner with us on this Sports Spectrum journey. Today's guest is Todd Geralds. Now, Todd is the author of the book Woodlawn, a a dramatic, powerful, and true story of redemption and reconciliation that occurred in the middle of what many say was the most racially charged and volatile era of Birmingham, Alabama's history. And of course, if you recognize the movie, or I should say the title Woodlawn, It was because it was made into a movie back in 2015, a fantastic movie, and uh, it tells the story of Tandy Gerald, who is the the coach that uh, took uh, this football team and reached it to new heights, but also really kind of brought this roster together during, like I said, a time of racial tension, and the movie's really good. It was a major motion picture a couple years ago, and it its message of hope and faith and God's incredible power to change lives through love has already made a huge impact in our public and our private schools and churches and athletic teams, businesses. I tell you, my 13-year-old daughter loves Woodlawn. She loves watching it. Even though it is a football movie, its, its message is what resonates with her and so many others. And Todd joins us today, and we talk about his story on the podcast, about Woodlawn, his story. It's really a true story of growing up as the son of, of Tandy Gerald's and Todd Gerald's being the son uh, of a football coach and what that looks like growing up in the South and Alabama, their love and passion for football. And it's really interesting to talk, to talk to him about just what life was like back then growing up in the seventies and now being a dad himself and turning that around. And and Todd uh, is really good at kind of talking about these topics, and I think you'll enjoy hearing him. He's also the author of a brand new book, Always Fall Forward, and he writes this book as life lessons that he'll never forget from the coach, the coach, of course, being his dad, Tandy Geralds. And this is a cool book. I think it came out from Tyndale, just recently released, and it's very short chapters, almost done in a weekly format, sort of a devotional that you can look at once a week and kind of find encouragement, life lessons I'll never forget from the coach. It's called Always Fall Forward by Todd Gerald. So let's get right to it. Here is our conversation. Todd Gerald's author of the new book, Always Fall Forward. Todd, how are you? I'm doing really well, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. Todd, it's great to talk with you. I'm excited to kind of dive into a little bit of your story and a little bit of the book and why you wrote it. But let's start with Woodlawn, because I think a lot of people, when I say Woodlawn, they know that movie. It was a powerful movie, I thought, really well done by the Irwin brothers. Came out, I think, 2015, and my daughter loves it. We watched it a number number of times. I think it's an important movie as far as 
racial reconciliation, which uh, obviously in the 70s and in the Deep South, that was a big issue. So many of us know this, the movie Woodlawn, but we don't know the story. So for those who haven't, can you give us like a synopsis on the story, your role in it, how you are part of this whole Woodlawn thing? Sure. So those of you who have seen the movie um, know that uh, Coach Tandy Geralds was the head football coach at Woodlawn. And um, a, a character in the movie that I feel like is one of the more pivotal characters um, just playing that is the son. That's me. I'm the son of Coach Gerald. So I, I was the kid that grew up um, hanging out, you know, at Jim Rat, tagging along with my dad, loved his football players um, and uh, loved being around that. And um, really what happened, Jason, was the older I got, the more significant i realized that was those the occurrences that happened there and i think it's like when you're when you're young you're seeing everything for the first time and so the profundity of the moment is kind of lost on you and i i think that that happens with us as adults too we don't realize the the significance of the moment we're living in until years later we look back and and really that's been a prayer of mine over the last several years was for god to open my eyes to the fact that he's at work always you know um and that the the his story is being we you know woven throughout our daily life and um and let's not miss it you know so for me the older i got i got into high school and i was actually playing for my dad we'd moved to a new town up in north alabama and there was still still a fair amount of racism there um that was unresolved there'd been a big race fight in the the uh, cafeteria the year before we got there um And so I, at that point, I kind of realized, wow, that Woodlawn thing was pretty significant. Then I went off and played college football at Jacksonville State University and talking there with my teammates, I realized that everybody came from different places, small towns in Georgia and Alabama and uh, across the Southeast. And I would hear their stories and I realized, you know, once again, wow, that, that thing that happened at Woodlawn was pretty amazing. And um, then I had my own children and um, I think that just the idea of legacy and things like that. I wanted my children to understand what happened and really where we've come from as a country and and even uh, within my family, where we've come from. Unfortunately, my dad was diagnosed with cancer uh, with the birth of my third daughter. I have four daughters, Mm -hmm. uh, but my third daughter was born. And suddenly I, I felt like we may not have that much time left for my children to get to know him and hear this story from him. Uh, so I began to travel. I was living up in the Northeast at that time near Philly and was traveling back and forth as much as I could to speak with him about everything that had happened uh, at Woodlawn, but also just reliving stories of, of, of things that he had taught me. But um, I wrote Woodlawn because I wanted it to be documented, you know, what happened there and really wrote it as a history. I was somewhat detached from uh, my my father and our relationship as much as I wanted this to be good history that that people could go back to this and and have facts and understand exactly what transpired during that time Um, and so that's kind of it just a a quick aside to know this it was actually dad's first year as head coach at Woodlawn um, the year that the federal government mandated the busing and the forced integration of the schools Mm -hmm. so he was a 29 year old first year head coach at this big, big school when all of this, this happened. And when, when God did what he did at Woodlawn, it changed my dad and the impact that that had on me years later, I became a Christian at football camp, um, you know, playing for my dad. So it kind of came full circle and, um, had a huge impact impact on me. And therefore I wanted to share it with others. Describe the obsession might be the right word for football in Alabama (laughs) for you growing up obviously Alabama huge football state right now obviously you have the national (laughs) champions in the in the Crimson Tide and certainly Auburn had a good year as well but describe growing up in the deep south in Alabama and what football meant for you and your family sure well that's um I kind of joke with people because like I married a, a young lady Jennifer who we've been married for about 23 years now and um she came from a family where it just wasn't that important. Uh, for me, it was like the family business. You know, my, my dad, uh, played ball and and then played ball in college at Auburn and got out and immediately started coaching. But this state has always been so nuts about 
college football because we have no professional teams. We we have a minor league baseball team and um, and then a few uh, minor league type teams uh, in other sports, but really football, college football ruled. And the, the history at the University of Alabama has been, you know, very well documented. Probably uh, they, Michigan, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, probably the very best, uh, you could throw USC in there, but probably the very best football traditions ever. Um, mm-hmm. And the current run, you know, people today are aware of how dominant Alabama has been, but their history has been like that. And Auburn has been, you know, is, a, is probably a top 10 to 12 wins um, over the history of, of the game as well. So, all you know, having two teams like that in the same state is just nuts. And, um, and you know, it, it starts at a young age. You start playing um, very, very early. I started playing in second grade, uh, played up into college. And, um, you know, a lot of kids do that. And high school football, I think probably next to Pennsylvania and Texas uh, and maybe Ohio, um, Alabama State uh, – high school football is is pretty crazy mm. um, th- those four are probably the, the big ones i think that um have this and it's and it is it's it's probably taken too seriously at times to be honest you know it's uh, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it sure is a lot of fun um you know if you if you can keep it in the you know don't get your identity from whether your team wins or loses on a saturday but it's uh, it's a lot of fun oh yeah absolutely we're talking to todd <laughs> gerald's here author of the book Woodlawn, also author of the new book, which we'll talk about in a minute, Always Fall Forward, here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. And and Todd, with regards to Woodlawn, I remember a scene in the movie that showed and depicted your dad as he was coming to faith in Christ. And I wonder if you could share with us how realistic that scene was, and if it was realistic, just kind of paint the picture of your dad's faith and where it kind of started. Sure. And, and really this to me is a, is a significant, I mean, obviously anytime someone comes to Christ, it's significant, but in terms of his overall story, there's some significance apart from him just around simple acts of obedience of other people that really led him to, to Christ and to the, the ultimate decision to follow Jesus. Um, the, the way that it, the, the, what happened in the movie, they actually took words that he had written from his testimonies so the things he said in the church scene at his baptism and things uh in the movie were his words his conversion actually happened earlier in the process than the movie depicted they had it happening um after the huffman game Mm. which was a really big game where they had beaten the previous state champion who'd not been scored on and you know, like a year or something. And it was really Tony Nathan's breakout uh, where everybody all of a sudden knew this guy was for real and, and Woodlawn was for real. They they did some things for dramatic reasons there that uh, helped with the continuity of the movie. But the reality was there was an FCA meeting at a, a student's home, one of the players' home. And they, they actually depict this in the movie, but that was the week before school started. And my dad had seen the team, you know, it's well um, chronicled in the movie when uh, the gospel is shared with dad's team and they, the entire team came to Christ. Uh, The movie had a few stragglers who were uh, kind of the, uh, the nemesis in in the movie and the bad guys in the movie. Uh, The reality was uh, there were four guys on the team prior to the gospel being shared who were Christians. Um, After the gospel was shared at their football camp, the rest of the team came to Christ and my dad saw this. And I think he thought that, um, that this will probably wear off. You know, this is an emotional experience. He knew that something had happened um, because he watched this sudden unity form that seemed like you couldn't fake it, you know, from considering where we were in Birmingham, Alabama in in a racially torn city, you know, that had been known as Bombingham actually mm. at that time because of so many bombings and so much uh, of, of white supremacists who hated black people. And to see them come together, dad knew something had happened, but he just kind of kept it at arm's you know length and um, waited to see if it was going to die down. But instead he saw exact, you know, the exact opposite. He saw the guys getting closer and closer. And even, you know, in the, in the heat of Alabama summer practice, two days and stuff, instead of finger pointing, there were guys helping each other up and, and loving each other. And he began to see really what Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35. He said, you know, um, basically a new commandment I give you that you love one another. And by this, 
the world will know that you're my disciples. They'll know that it's real Mm -hmm. by the love you have for each other. So the gospel for dad, you know, he heard the gospel, but it may be that his ears were kind of clogged and he, he, uh, he needed to see it. And he did. He saw it in the body of Christ being lived out in front of him. So when that FCA meeting was called for the Friday before school started, dad was really concerned. He was still, you know, football coach, concerned about winning and losing, didn't want there to be any division. And he was concerned that uh, the black kids wouldn't be welcomed at the home or they wouldn't show up and, and, and these things. So he decided, and really a couple of the kids asked him to come and he decided to come. Well, the movie didn't show that uh, two or three families had actually rejected the request to have the FCA meeting at their home because they didn't want those kids, so to speak, you know, in their home. But one family um, decided that um, that they would, that they would open their, their house up to uh, the team. And um, dad went and he saw this family uh, welcoming the kids Um he um it was the miller family by the way to give them a shout out um ms miller they they knew that they were called to be hospitable and they saw the parents loving the kids no matter what they looked like saw the kids loving each other you know uh, on the couch sitting around the room sharing laughing cutting up and and really dad knew what they have is real and i i don't have it and he actually slipped out without anybody knowing and driving home from that thing, he began talking to Jesus and kind of culminated with him on his knees next to his bed at our little house in, uh, you know, the outskirts of, of Birmingham and him giving his life to Christ. And, um, and the cha- transformation in him was, was remarkable. Even as a, a little boy to be able to see the difference in my dad and how um, his heart changed from uh, one that was just all about, his tasks and things he wanted to accomplish to, to really having purpose in what he did. And, and that purpose was to love people. Well, so true. It's so true. Now growing up as the son of a coach, I wonder for you, because obviously the coach player dynamic is so important. The movie depicts this with uh, the story of Tony Nathan, who went on to play at Alabama and then I went on to have a great NFL career with the Miami dolphins. And then certainly a coaching career as yep. well, very successful coaching career. But, I wonder from being the son of a coach, and we kind of saw that a little bit in the movie, Remember the Titans, with the daughter of a coach. What was that like being the son of a coach? Does it does it affect the, the sort of dad dynamic because your dad sure. is a coach? Or was it sort of, I don't know, what kind of relationship was that yeah. like growing up? I think it's, I think that there was, um, there was, uh, the, the dynamics are kind of all over the board. I think that, um, the effect, it was probably more in terms of how it affected my relationship with him as a coach and less how it affected my relationship with him as a dad. I think um, as a coach, I so desperately wanted to please him because he was my dad. You know, so uh, mm-hmm. there was that, the dynamic of really wanting to make my dad proud not wanting um, anyone to question whether I was getting any favoritism, you know, really wanting to go above and beyond um, to make my dad look good, (laughs) you know, as a player. And so dad was able, I mean, we watched a lot of film together at home. Um, You know, uh, we did, we did talk shop at home, but I never doubted him as my dad. I I wasn't concerned that if I screwed up on the football field, was I going to come home? and, and him have anything against me. We didn't bring home the junk. We, you know, you know, if I, if I did something wrong, um, on the football field, I think that it just really drove me to to want to please him. And, and that can, you know, that can be unhealthy. I think, uh, to a certain degree, I think a lot of boys, um, have a desperate desire to make their fathers proud. Um, and you know, that can become an idol to a, a child. If you're a believer and, you know, for you to feel whole about yourself means that you have to have the approval of your of your earthly father um, that can begin to dominate and, and can be unhealthy. And, and really, he and I had to kind of work through some things later in my life as I recognized that he wasn't God himself. He wasn't the perfect you know, picture of masculinity. He wasn't all every, you know, the end all be all of manhood. But he was a really good man who was doing his best. And we actually worked through some of the things that later in life I realized, you know, man, you could have you kind of hurt me a little bit there and and had to forgive him. And once I did those things, 
um, really our relationship went, it, it became one of a father and a son in, in a healthy way where I loved him as a human being and as a man doing his best, as opposed to, I just want to get approval from you. It's like I was one of those uh, relationships I had was where I'm trying to suck the life out of my dad for him to tell me I'm okay. Um, mm -hmm. where the other one is, I want to give back into you too. And I realized that, um, you know, you, you're just a man, just like I am. And, uh, when I was about 23 years old, we had, um, really some, uh, resolution to some things that, you know, later in life, I kind of dealt with that were, you know, he wasn't perfect, but, um, and that's, that's the danger of, uh, idolizing, uh, an earthly father. Um, that's the danger of idolizing anything. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask you what that was like. You you talk about some reconciliation issues as far and as deep as you'd like to take it. What sure. were those sort of issues yeah. and things you had to work through? Well, you know, really, um, as a, about a 23 year old man, I, I actually began to really battle, um, significant depression and um was, was really dealing with that and uh so as a as a believer i i went um to a christian counselor and and started talking through a lot of things and really realized i'd had an unhealthy um view of my dad i had i had put him on such a pedestal because he was a godly man he was a successful coach he you know um but my identity didn't need to be tied into my dad's opinion of me and things, you know, I think that one of the things I realized going through that process and even as a father today is that, you know, you are going to be sinned against if you live in this world, even the good people, you know, even the people who are brothers and sisters or even our fathers and mothers, um, because they're sinners too, they're going to do things that hurt us. Um, our call as believers is to forgive. Mm. And when we don't forgive, a lot of unhealthy things start happening. And Jesus alludes to this as he's, you know, telling the story of, you know, if you, um, it's, it's like torture <laughs> internally. Yeah. Um, if you hold on to, to bitterness, it, it, and I've heard it described so many ways, you know, when, if my dad went and, and played golf with some buddies, instead of asking me to go with him, I held that against him yeah. and that I would internalize that as there's something wrong with me and dad chose them over me and, and these things. And, and, you know, it seems simple. Um, and it seems like why in the world would a little boy do that? But it's our nature. Um, you know, I think it was CS Lewis who said that our, our hearts are an idol factory. You know, we will, we will produce idols as fast as, as our mind can work, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I had placed too much on what my dad thought of me as opposed to resting in who Jesus said I was. And, um, and so those things had to be resolved. And really, once I recognized them, I went to my dad and my dad showed really that he was the kind of man that I, uh, that I, I knew him to be. And that was, you know, um, a repentant, uh, I'm sorry, you know, and a lot of people don't get that they don't get the opportunity I did, to, you know, with a godly father to to be able to have that kind of reconciliation. But it's still so, so important that that you that we forgive, uh, you know, that we let those things go. And, and the, the quote I've, I've used so many times is when we hold on to those things, it's like us drinking poison and expecting it to kill the other guy. Yes. Yep. <laughs> you know, and. Um, and it's, it's killing us it and it is. begins to, to separate us. And so, and I know you have, uh, obviously forgiveness is a huge topic for you. So, uh, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir when I talk about this, but, hmm. um, so dad and I, when I was 23, 24 and dealing with a lot of those things really had a, at that point, our, our relationship went from a little boy idolizing his father to two men who knew we're both extremely fallible. Um, we're weak. We both need Jesus and, um, we both need forgiveness. And, um, and really our relationship grew, um, from that point to, to being very much, um, still father and son, but, but very much a, a friendship. Somebody asked me a couple days ago about my book and they said, your book could be a movie. It's got all these stories and all these other <laughs> things. And I thought there's no way that nobody ever would want to make a movie about my story and my book. So I'll <laughs> ask you, since that took place, what yeah. was that process like in going from you writing your book to all of a sudden seeing this come to <laughs> life on the big screen and becoming a movie in Woodlawn? 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it was, it was surreal. Um, there's no question about that. I mean, even today, um, you know, um, you and I talking earlier, um, off microphone just about uh the the fact that we never dreamed that we'd write books or, or these things you know obviously i didn't think somebody would have a movie about about our situation but um right. it was surreal um I, and yet it was um the story itself was so amazing um that it was definitely not shocking i mean my dad and i had talked about this being uh, that this is the stuff of movies. And then when I was, uh, you know, whatever, I guess it was like 20 years ago that remember the Titans came out, which is shocking mm. <laughs> that it was that long ago. But yeah. um, I, when I saw that movie, I was like, Hey, this is just like, you know, what happened when I was a kid. And so the fact that the, the move that the story became a movie is not shocking. The fact that I got to be involved in it, um, it it's really humbling to, to be able to get to tell your story you know, this is a story that's, it's really about, it's about God. It's about what Jesus did yeah. in, in a, a town, a school, and in the lives of, of the individuals involved. And um, so I, I was thrilled and really, I was working on this book when I got a call from the Irwin brothers and um, their father was the chaplain on my dad's football team. So when they called me, I knew what they were calling me about. I mean, yeah. it wasn't going to be the Todd Gerald story. It was, you know, so I, um, Basically, they were like, we really want to do this and we want it to be authoritative. So, um, you know, do get that book done. Basically, <laughs> you know, kind of yeah. what, what people they like, how do you get a book published and how do you get a movie deal? And, and I was like, don't follow my um, the way it happened with me, because it, that's not how it normally happens. God right. just threw this in my lap. Yeah. And um, and what a great opportunity. And I mean, I think he did it that way. So he'd know, Todd, you're not, you know. <laughs> You're nothing amazing. I am. He's like, he doesn't need us to do the spectacular. He just wants simple obedience and love and he'll do the rest. And, um, and when we say, you know, Hey, I'm ordinary. That's, I'm saying that just in terms that we're all, we all have stories We're we all have spectacular things that, that go on, that God does, you know, yeah. through our individual stories. And, um, and it's not how great I am. It's how great he is. And, um, he really made that clear to me, you know, he does the spectacular through the ordinary because in God's eyes, there is no ordinary. That's right. And, um, so that's, um, you know, kind of a nutshell of, of what happened there. And I believe, you know, I, in my process of writing my book, live to forgive, I believe that God revealed to me that if we have a story and every single one of us does, whether yeah. we're ordinary, extraordinary, famous, whatever, we all have stories. And if we don't tell them when we know that they can help someone else, then we're actually yeah. being selfish and we're not following the call that God has placed in our life. So I'm, I'm grateful for you that you shared the Woodlawn story. And now as we close down here, I want to talk about your new book, Always Fall Forward. And it's not really a book as much as it sort of is a devotional. So why don't you tell us... Yeah. Uh, and let me read the, the subtitle. It says life lessons. I'll never forget from the coach that the coach being your dad. So Todd Gerald's tell us about always fall forward, why you wrote it and what we can expect if we pick this book up. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, the, the reality of the Woodlawn book was I, I wrote it somewhat detached emotionally. I mean, if you read the book, the, you read the preface and you get a little bit of my heart and a little bit about the relationship I had with my dad. But from that point on, um, uh, Mark Schleyball, um, who you probably know from uh, ESPN, he, yep. um, he helped a lot with the book. And really, we were trying to get an accurate history. So Mark did a bunch of research, and I'm really grateful to him. Um, and we wrote a book that actually there was a seminary, I think it's called Gordon Conwell or something like that, that... Um, recommends this book for urban ministry, um, you know, classes, because it's a good history of what, uh, what God does and how he works in the inner city and, and between uh, races where, where there's division. But as such, I didn't get into my relationship with my dad at all. Um, and so the emotional part of it, there was still a whole lot that I felt like, you know, nobody really knows anything about my dad other than his conversion experience. And, um, there's so much more that I'd like to tell. And so I really wanted to be able to share with people a little bit more of my heart and, and the emotional side of things from my dad. And, um, and really Tyndale House um, 
was so gracious. Um, they liked the idea and when I uh, presented it to them. And, um, and it allowed me to go back. And, and for men, there's not a whole lot of, of um, I mean, there's some really good ones. Tony Dungy has done some, but there's not a, a, a huge range of, of devotional type products um, geared specifically to men. And so this book takes you onto the football field. And really, there's actually some fairly technical uh, football stuff in it that, yeah. you know, kind of gets into the way the game works and everything else. But what I do is I talk about what we were learning on the field and, and what the principle behind that is, and then take you to, to how does that look in real life, you know, off of the football field? What's the principle there? And what does the Bible say about it? And then it gives actually some a uh, couple of questions and things to help you to think through it and how you can apply it to your life. And 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 really, Jason, I, I did the audio, uh, the audible version of the book. And as I went back through it, I realized, you know, this is a fun book. I mean, this is a book that as a man, um, it does kind of connect my brain and my heart and my soul um, while, you know, applying scripture directly to it. And it's not a fluff um, thing the the there it's strong in the Bible. It, it really uses the, the word of God uh, to get the message across. And, um, and, and I, I, I think that it will be um, useful. I'm very, very pleased with it. Absolutely. The book is called always fall forward. It's about, I don't know, 220 pages or so, but what it is, is it's a devotional that you can read once a week. So it's not something you have to get in every day. Although I recommend that you kind of reread every day. Mm -hmm. But I want I just want to read a little bit of a an idea, a snapshot from the book and then we'll close and it's on page 212 and you write dad was very fond of measuring his players, not against each other, but against their previous personal bests. Sure he still tracked and congratulated guys who had the very best times or lifts overall, but he made it a point to encourage personal growth and achievement against your biggest challenger yourself. Dad taught me you don't have to be the best, but you need to be your best. As a player, you don't control your genetic ceiling, the limits of what you are able to do physically. What you do control, what you do control is your effort. Personal effort and commitment are what allow any individual to scrape the ceiling of his or her potential. That's just a little snippet of the goodness that is in this book called Always Fall Forward by our guest, Todd Geralds, he's also the author of Woodlawn, and his story is depicted in the movie Woodlawn, along with his dad, the coach. So definitely check all those out. And Todd, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Appreciate you joining us here on the on the podcast. And the last question we always ask uh, our guests, and this is one that sometimes is an easy question, but it's not always an easy answer. And <laughs> For you right now in your life, where you are, 2018, what have you been learning from the Lord? What is God teaching you? Whew, man, we could do another podcast on this. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it, it's really, really clear to me um, that um, God has made it very, very clear to me. Uh, I mentioned part of this before that that we all have stories that that we need to tell. That that we need to tell. God doesn't need anything. He wouldn't be God if He's in need. But He is allowing us to participate in His story. You know, He has this redemptive story, and He's saying, you know, you have an opportunity to come alongside and, and share your story. Uh, and it will benefit the world in a way that only you can do. But uh, but the other thing that goes with that that I am learning and just in a very, very clear and vivid way is that this spiritual realm is real, that there is a true battle going on for souls and minds and hearts. And when we engage and and want to do God's will and seek after him, we're going to have fiery darts and, and missiles and things come at us and not to think for a second that that's something from a movie or anything else. It is very, very real. And um, as the body of Christ, we, we need to be aware of that, but also be aware that uh, the battle is already won. Jesus has won it and that the power is on our side, God's power, the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ and, and prayer is stronger than the enemy. Uh, but that's been uh, a lot going on uh, just with my family and different things like that, where we see that it, it's a real battle, um, but God, you know, is faithful. Absolutely. He is Todd Geralds, the author of the book, Always Fall Forward and of Woodlawn fame. Todd, thanks so much for joining us here in the podcast. It's been nice to hear your story and I look forward to talking to you down the road. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jason. 
And we do appreciate Todd Geralds for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast, talking about life lessons that he uh, learned and says he'll never forget from the coach, his dad, Coach Tandy Geralds, down in Alabama. You can find out more about Todd and certainly order his book, Always Fall Forward, over at Todd Geralds, G-E-R-E-L-D-S.com. Todd Geralds. Dot com. The book was just released by Tyndale, so check it out. Uh, again, it's it's really written in a in a way where you don't have to dive in and spend you know a ton of time in the book every day. You can literally read it, and it's broken down into fifty two weeks, so you can literally read once a week uh, and have this life lesson. Bring a notebook, take some notes, and, and really just be encouraged by Todd Gerald's and his new book, Always Fall Forward. We thank you so much for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You can always reach us on Twitter at Sports underscore Spectrum. We're also on Instagram and Facebook as well as our YouTube channel. And you can email us here, Jason at SportsSpectrum.com. Let us know what you think of the episode. Post about it on social media. Tell people about this podcast. And of course, leave a review over at iTunes if you could. Those reviews help and bring more Uh, awareness of this podcast to others to bring us the stories on the intersection of sports and faith. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.